If you were to wear a blood pressure cuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week, let's say you're monitored by the medical community, and so you wear this thing all the time. You know, there's times when it would go up, other times it might be mellow, but you'll have some of those times maybe right before you walk down the aisle to say, I do, right, where your blood pressure is like off the charts, right? Or maybe right before graduation or, or the first time that you speak publicly in front of someone. There are some of those times that if your life was being monitored and your blood pressure, they'd go, oh, there goes the warning lights, right? That thing's getting high. Well, if you are like me, I suppose that one of those times would be on the day when a brand new boss shows up at work. How many of you have ever worked at a place on the first day of the new boss? Anybody? Yeah. And, and uh, the boss says, okay, call a meeting of everyone. A lot of things got to change around here, and it's going to start today. And everybody's blood pressure kind of goes, oh, you know, who's going to get to stay? Who's going to get, what changes are going to be made? And, and everybody kind of goes, uh, what's about to happen? Moses had a day like that, only times about a thousand, because he wasn't calling everyone together to meet with the new boss. He was calling everyone together to meet with their new God. That's a whole different level. Here's the deal. Even though the Jews were God's chosen people, he was pretty much a stranger to them, a great unknown. How in the world could that be? Well, the people that we now call the Jews, the nation we now call Israel, had lived for 400 years as a nation within a nation, within the borders of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, but they were not Egyptian. And so they lived as a little nation within a nation, completely surrounded by the weird Egyptian false gods that we see in the museums today. How many of you have ever been to a museum and seen these false, uh, these Egyptian gods? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, like Ra, the weird looking man with a falcon's head who they thought was the sun god. Or Geb, the, and I don't know why, but Geb, the, the earth god, he was a green man, and he's almost always depicted with a duck sitting on top of his head. I have no idea, but that was their earth god. Or Sobek. You've seen Sobek carved as a man, but with a crocodile face, and considered the god of the Nile River. Think about this. That was what the Jewish children were raised around. I'm talking about Israelites living under that influence for 400 years. That's twice as long as we've been a nation. I mean, 400 years ago this year is when the pilgrims had survived their first winter in the New World, and so they were getting ready to have Thanksgiving. That is how far back 400 years. It seems like ancient history to us. And so for 400 years, Years, the Jewish people lived as slaves in Egypt to the Egyptians, living under the demanding requirements of those slave owners. They weren't permitted to worship their God. There is no freedom of religion for them. How many of you know if you want to make people slaves, you've got to take away their freedom of religion? That's how that works. The Egyptians worshipped thousands of gods. We know the names of 1,500. That's a lot of gods. And all their gods wanted something. And all their gods had demands that you had better fulfill or else. At least that's what the overfed priests would have you believe. So even though Yahweh, our God, was their God, they knew almost nothing about him. How many of you remember he had to introduce himself to Moses? This is my name. I was the God of your ancestor Abraham. And he's like reintroducing himself to the people of Israel. They didn't even know his name. Why was that? The Jews had no temples to God. 
the God of Abraham. They had no statues of him so they could see what he looked like. They had no priests to tell them, oh, here's how to live. And they had nowhere to go to learn about him. The Jews were just slaves. They were nameless, faceless slaves with no God of their own that they were permitted for centuries. Reminds me of the time almost 2,000 years later when the Apostle Paul walked into Athens and he saw this altar but no idol on it. And he thought, that's weird. And he went and looked at it and inscribed on the altar, it said, to the unknown God. And for Israel, that could have been the description that they used because there was not one word of Scripture yet in the world. Not a fragment of a verse for them to know anything about God. Some of you were raised like them. Some of you were raised by people who worship, maybe, uh, whatever it is, they, maybe, maybe they worship power or they worshiped money. They're all about money. Everything is about money or sex or, or popularity or politics, uh, any number of things. But you were never raised to know the God who made you. Some of you had that experience. To you, he was an unknown God. If there was a Bible in the house, you don't know where it was. It was great grandma's and it's somewhere and nothing. So that's kind of how the people of Israel were. Now the people of Israel had a new God and they were in his debt. I mean, he'd rescued them from slavery. But where did he fit with all the gods they already knew about? Was he an add-on? Was he one of the Egyptians God, Egyptian gods, but with a different name? Or would he be more cruel and terrible than the Egyptian gods? I mean, those Egyptian gods sometimes said, throw your baby in the fire. Is this the kind of god? I mean, whoever it was, they're going to have to serve him. He's certainly stronger than all the gods he took out to bring them to this place of freedom. So God calls a meeting. <laughs> and I can imagine that the tension was thick. Moses tells the people, consecrate yourselves, purify yourselves, get everything ready, because he wants to meet with us in three days. God says he's going to meet with us. Tension time. What demands would he make? The scene is set for us in Exodus chapter 19. If you'd like, let's stand in honor of God's word. Was I read just a couple of verses to let you see the setting? Exodus 19, beginning with verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning. This is in the middle of the desert, friends. There was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently at the sound of the trumpet growing louder and louder and louder. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Imagine this scene. You may be seated. Let's look at what happened next. In a voice that drowned out the thunder and the screaming trumpet, God spoke. The people of Israel, for the rest of time, called it the ten words. And we call it the ten commandments. 
Many of you think about the Ten Commandments with these stone tablets, right? And with these little rounded tops, and it looks kind of cool, and God wrote on that. And, and we know that God did, in fact, inscribe on stone tablets the Ten Commandments. Often we forget that before that ever happened, the people of Israel heard God speak them in their own language. And so he began. Number one, I am your only God. Our relationship must be exclusive. Me, your God, you my people. I'm sure some people standing there thought, you, you mean we don't have to, to try to please those endless 1,500 deities anymore? God continued, number two, and no idols of anything. Those false images were made to intimidate you no more. Number three, only my name is given to you to pray to. Don't misuse it. This is starting to sound very different than anything they'd experienced up to this point. And then came number four, to this people who had been slaves their entire lives. I want you to have a holiday every single week. No more seven days a week slavery. I command that you get a day to rest every week. What? I wonder if at that moment they realized for the first time, we're not slaves anymore. Like, like we get to take a day and not work. Number five, I'm restoring families. Show your dads and moms respect, and I'll give you long life. God made us a promise? I heard it with his own voice. He made us a promise. God is a promise-making God. He, he will do good things for us. Number six, no one can take your life anymore. I say to all of you, do not kill. No one can steal your wife anymore. No adultery. No one can confiscate your things and keep them as their own. No stealing. No one can drag you into court on trumped-up charges. Uh, no false witness in my kingdom. Number 10, I don't even permit you to fixate longingly on what is not yours. It only leads to misery, no coveting. So people have been slaves all their lives. They could kill me if they decide to. <laughs> they could steal my wife if they want to. They could get my stuff. They could make me work 24 and 7. This was a declaration of independence. They were like, he's a kind God. By the time the voice fell silent, their world had changed forever. And our world, too. God had spoken. Some people think, oh, if only we could hear him speak out loud like that. Really? The people who heard it were overwhelmed, might be the right word. Like maybe wet their pants level of overwhelmed. I mean, this is a powerful God. He's not kind because he's weak. That voice that called heaven and earth into existence, thundering down from Sinai so deep and loud that it could be heard distinctly by six million people, every one of them, over the shrieking of the winds and the roaring of the flames and the screaming of the trumpet that just kept getting louder and louder. In Exodus 20, they begged Moses. They said, you go talk to him, and we'll listen to whatever you tell us from him, but do not have God keep speaking to us or we will die. There was something that was happening inside of them at the sound of the voice of the Creator. And they're like, I don't think we could take this. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 25, they kind of said, okay, we survived God speaking to us that once. 
Uh, but just barely. They said, for sure, if that keeps up, we won't be able to live. Even Moses said, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21, I am shaking in terror. So, I'm not positive that we would be more excited than terrified to hear that voice. But here's the point. Brothers and sisters, God speaks. And when He does, He reveals Himself to us. You mean I get to know you? I'll let you get to know me. You mean I'll get to hear you? I'll let you hear me. That amazing day when everybody heard the voice of God was referred to often throughout the rest of the Bible. In Nehemiah 9, as an example, Nehemiah said, you came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. They never got over it. God speaks. Those two words, God speaks, put a stake in the heart of the lie that God is some distant creator who just wound us up and let us go and moved on to more important things. A God who doesn't know you or doesn't care about you and, and you are on your own. That lie is dead. We're not deists who believe in a distant God that we can't know and that we'll never hear from and doesn't know us personally. We are theists. This means that we understand that God knows us personally. He is closer than the person sitting next to you. He is closer than the breeze, and he's paying close attention to you as an individual. He knows the number of hairs on the head of each person in this room. And he knows the total number. <laughs> he is a personal God. After speaking the Ten Commandments out loud in this civilization-shattering moment, God invited Moses back up onto the mountain, and God began to speak to his servant. And Moses, this is so important, began to write down what God said. God still speaks to us today through the Bible, the compilation of his words to us. Put yourself in the scene. Can you see Moses on the top of the mountain, parchment in hand? He's ready. God begins to speak. My people are going to need to know where everything came from. So write this down. In the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. Revelation. They'd be like, wait, the sun? You created this, the heavens? The sun is not a god? No. He made it. The earth is not a god? No, he made it. The moon made it. And I created all of the animals, God continued. They're not gods. All of nature is mine. You may study it, and you may learn about it. You don't have to fear it, and you don't have to worship it, and you don't have to make sacrifices to the river. You can study the river. And so science became possible, and the foundations of modern civilization were laid. Moses, they'll need to know why there's cruelty and evil in the world. I need to tell them about the created being who rebelled against me and caused their pain. It happened in a garden called Eden, where I'd placed the first man and the first woman. And God spoke, and Moses wrote. And they need to know their own ancestry. I'll introduce them to a man named Abraham, their great, 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 great grandfather, and I'll tell them what I loved about him so that they can become like him too, trusting me and talking to me every day. I like that. 
And so Moses began taking dictation from God. The first five books of the Bible, called the Pentateuch, came into existence. The Jews call it the Torah, which means the teachings or the law, because God's laws were what taught them about what he was like. God speaks out loud when he chooses. But God speaks through what he dictated to Moses and King David and King Solomon and the prophet Isaiah and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Peter and Paul. God speaks. What a gift the Bible is. Can you imagine what God has given us? It's got amazing true stories in it. The fat king and the left-handed assassin, that's an interesting one. The riddle that started a war, that's fascinating. The plot to murder a man who had already died. I mean, there's stories, there's history in there that you just go, you've got to be kidding me. But more importantly... The Bible is a supernatural communication from God's heart to your hearts. It is ancient and mysterious. It introduces us to the spiritual dimension of life because it introduces us to our maker who is a spirit. It's mysterious, but it's readable. It's infinitely deep, but the first time reader can begin to understand it the first time that they read. No other book has ever been written like this book. When you open this book, the author sits down next to you and says, would you like me to explain this to you? Buy a book like that anywhere else on the planet. It's astonishing. It comes to us from the days when the pharaohs walked the earth, but it's still fresh. And relevant. It was written in such a way that it transcends every language and every culture. Primitive people groups in the Amazon can read it and learn to be wise. Sophisticated businessmen in the penthouses of Hong Kong can find in it that which their empty souls have been looking for their entire lives. Professors, prostitutes, both need it and both are blessed by it. It untangles messed up thinking. It builds a moral foundation for nations. It expresses thoughts that have never been thought anywhere else and it introduces us to a massive, infinitely brilliant mind, the mind of God. Make no mistake, this book camouflaged in paper and leather, or speaking to us through the electronic pathways of our cell phones is the reason that we have civilization. But all of that, pay close attention, all of that, every bit of what I just said, shrinks into insignificance compared to this. This book introduces us to Jesus. Through this, we found out about him. What a gift. The life of Jesus sings from every page. God's plan of the ages was to introduce mankind to his son Jesus and to introduce every man, woman, and child to him personally so that you can know him. You can wake up talking to him. You can walk through your day shoulder to shoulder with the one who said, I'll never leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. And you can drift off to sleep tonight in the loving presence of him who said, come to me in your tiredness with your burdens and I'll give you rest. This book is the only word because it introduces us to Jesus, the living word. In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, this book introduces us to Him. When we get to the New Testament, something interesting happens. There's another time when the voice of God booms from heaven like thunder. 
at the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus on this earth. You see, in the Old Testament, when the Old Covenant was being given to the people, God's voice sounded from heaven. And in the New Testament, when God's New Covenant was given to us, that voice sounded from heaven. At the side of the Jordan River, with all of Israel gathered around, Jesus was baptized by John the baptizer, and when he came up from under the water and stood wiping the streaming water from his face, suddenly, Scripture says, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Amen. That was before Jesus did the first thing in his public ministry. Did you ever stop to think about this? This time, the voice from heaven had no commands to give Jesus, no corrections do differently. It was just a declaration, I am proud of my son. And then, near the end of the ministry of Jesus, here's excuse me, here on earth, he took Peter and James and John up on a mountaintop in this amazing scene that we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus was transformed before their very eyes and became brilliant. Mark said, he he shone brighter than anything could be bleached. (laughs) He He didn't even know how to describe the glory of God that infused Jesus at that moment on the top of the mountain. And who shows up on that mountain? Moses and Elijah. I wonder if Moses had a sense of deja vu, like, here I am again. (laughs) I'm standing on the earth. And once again, we're at the top of the mountain in Israel, and he's here. And once again, there's suddenly this voice from heaven that terrifies the men who were there. But this time, what Moses hears is very different than the first time. It's not the giving of the law. It is the unveiling of his grace. The voice that Moses heard that day on the Mount of Transfiguration said the exact same words that the Father had said at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, listen, word for word, this is my Son, whom I love. With Him, I am well pleased. And then God added, listen to Him. He is now the Word. He is now me speaking. When you hear Him, you hear me, the Father says. Listen to Him. It turns out that the awesome and terrifying God of the universe is a proud Father who loves to talk about His Son. The Old Testament prepares the way for Jesus. The Gospels introduce us to Jesus. The book of Acts informs us of the worldwide impact of Jesus. The epistles teach us how to live like Jesus. And the book of Revelation is the book of the revelation of Jesus. And it sings the victory song of Jesus, letting us know that when all is said and done, he will be over all and we will live with him forever. Oh, do you have any idea what God has given us? From the sublime to the ridiculous. I bought this book the other day. I do not recommend anyone buy it. (laughs) This book is a piece of junk. In fact, this book is damnable, and I don't use that word very often. It's called the Jefferson Bible. I don't recommend it. Thomas Jefferson, a brilliant intellect, but a godless man, took the Bible and decided to strip out of it everything supernatural. He chopped out all the miracles that God did for his people. He chopped out the virgin birth of Jesus. He chopped out the resurrection. His Bible ends 
Let me, let me read you how it ends. There was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher. There, they lay, there laid they Jesus and rolled a great stone over the door of the sepulcher and departed. End of Jefferson's story. He pridefully wrote, this document is proof that I am a real Christian. That, it. that is to say, I'm quoting, a disciple, listen, very important. He says, I'm a disciple, listen, of the doctrines of Jesus. We know today through DNA proof that while he was claiming to be the disciple of the doctrines of Jesus, Jefferson was raping and having children with his slaves. That is not Jesus. Jefferson was a disciple, perhaps, of the doctrines of Jesus, but he was not a disciple of Jesus himself. Of men like that, our Lord sadly declared that his eternal sentence would be, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This book, without that Lord, is nothing. But this book, with that Lord, is salvation. What a difference. You might, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. Bible scholars who only study the Bible as literature go to hell. And it's my personal opinion that hell is going to be crammed with Bible scholars who never entered a personal relationship with Jesus because the ones who did will be with him. So to be honest, we don't want to go there, right? Would you agree we don't want to go there? But I wonder what God must think of those, even maybe in this room, who do believe in Jesus, but don't ever get around to reading the book that God wrote to us about him, <laughs> about his treasured son. God speaks. Yes, God speaks to us in our day, but he usually, not always, but usually speaks through the Bible. And shouldn't this be obvious? He wants us to read it. Somebody says, oh, Pastor Steve, if you only know how busy I am, God could make you less busy. <laughs> if that's the excuse, run with it. He can lay you up, he can lay you down. Because he wants you to know his son. To know Jesus is life eternal. And it's worth it. Listen to the word of God speaking. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and verse 17. I am wrapping this up, but I want you to hear it. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. If you don't know what, he tells you. For rebuking, if you're drifting off track, he helps you. For correcting, if you're in thinking errors, he can help you to think straight. And for training in righteousness so that you can live the way you want to live for him. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. From his mouth <laughs> to your ears. Through his word. This is the voice of God. You can trust it. So as we close, uh, ha have you determined to make yourself, as much as God permits, in the amount of time you have left in this world, a student of God's word? If Jesus were to come back this week, is there anything that you'd rather have him catch you doing than reading about him? Have you determined 
Lord, with your help, I'm going to become a student of your word until maybe someday I'll be an expert in your word because I want to bring glory to Jesus. I pray that you will. I pray that you will. The Father speaks. We have what he revealed. He gave us the Bible to introduce us to Jesus. And now he has given us his Holy Spirit to remind us of what Jesus says. John 14, 26. How can he remind you if you've never read it? Let's, let's stand together. Let's, let's stand up. We're, we're, we're going to pray right now, brother. Just a minute. We're going to pray. Father, I want to thank you for your presence with us today. You love us. <laughs> it's so obvious. And wherever we have been enslaved by anything else, would you free us? And would you allow us to hear your voice and hear it through your word? Oh, Father, if there's anybody here in this room or listening to my voice on the broadcast, I pray in Jesus' name that right now they'd be so hungry to know Jesus that they would just say to you right now in their hearts, I want to know him because I know you hear them. You speak. Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who doesn't know you, I ask that they would just inside of themselves right now pray, Father, forgive me for all my sins. There's so many of them, I I couldn't even name them all. Please forgive me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to take my sins away so that I could get to know him and you and the Holy Spirit. I say yes to that. I say yes. And Father, for those of us in this room, and I count myself one of them, who would have to confess that sometimes life gets so busy that we lose focus and don't spend the time in your word that we know we want to, I pray for a new start today in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just pray that these people would become in their neighborhoods the Bible expert. Not for pridefulness, just so everyone knows, if I want to know about God, I know where to go and who to talk to. Father, I pray that you would do that in Jesus' name for all of us. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.